everybody else to my parents' house um, without my parents being here. They're on a cruise. I don't think they know that this is going on, so clear up afterwards. <coughs> um, and um, today, um, the Tzedakah of the Week is Nishima, um, and it is artists helping youngsters to connect to their Yadut via art and music, correct? Oh, and you will tell us more later. Yes. Um, so that's 10 shekels or however much more you want to give to the Tzedakah. Please turn off your mobile phones. Um, and that's about it, really. Okay. You, you can give the money afterwards. So thank you. That was a nice, that's a nice surprise. Um, and uh, there's Hashem. Use it for some for good things. Okay. So I, I, I first of all thank all of you for coming here and inviting me into this is your home. And um, I thought I would like to start just to have us uh, sing a nigun together that very much for me, and hopefully for you, relates to the topic that we're going to talk about, that we're going to learn about together, okay?
story of that needle? I may have told it in somebody's presence before. Anybody know the story of that needle? Where it comes no from? story. I thought it goes back to times of Beit Hamikdash. Right. How do you know? I'm a calling too. So. <laughs> so I'll tell you how I know. Yeah. I had a landlord in Los Angeles. His name was Michael Kaplan. Oh, Michelle. And one day, he comes to me and he says, you know, you think, you, you think you're a musician, you know music? He says, I'll tell you something that you don't know. He said, I, I was a teenager in Russia and there was pogromim and, and world war. And he said, I had to escape and I was hiding in the forest. And a young guy comes over to me and he tells me, I'm a student of the Chafetz Chaim. I want to take you to our yeshiva. So the Chaim Amish saved his life. He takes him to the yeshiva. And he was, uh, you know, adjunctly learning in the inner circle of the Chafetz Chaim. The Chafetz Chaim was a Kohen. And the Kohanim on Shlosh uh, Shlosh Galim, they would go in and they would go up, as we did when we lived in Chutzlart, and we did the Kav Kohanim three times a year plus Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And they sang that nigun always before the last word, before Vichunekha, before. Uh, Yishmerecha, Bichumecha, and Shalom. And they would sing that nigan. And one day he says, the Chavetz Chaim told me that he has a Masoret in his family that this nigan was sung in the Beit HaMikdash. Both the Levim, and I don't know about the Kohanim, but this nigan was sung in the Beit HaMikdash. And it's, to me, really interesting because if you listen to this nigan, it has a real... Um, kind of like traveling flow to it, and it goes to different places. It might start out sad, but somehow it takes you to a much, a really strong place where you feel safe and secure. So I thought that's how we could spend our time tonight, talking a little bit about the journey of us, the journey of the Jewish people from the beginning <coughs> of the Korban Beit HaMikdash <coughs> to, sadly enough, the modern day continuation of the Korban HaMikdash, or even perhaps as some people see it, the regeneration of the Korban Beit HaMikdash. So I thought we could look at it through a few different uh, eyes and hearts through the eyes of the Slavon Rebbe, and, and through the eyes of the Maharal, and um, through your eyes. So I thought, if you're willing, we could do a, an exercise. Before we talk about the Beit HaMikdash, everybody takes a piece of paper and just draws in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> what is the Beit HaMikdash? Whatever the Beit HaMikdash, whatever you think the Beit HaMikdash is going to be. Whatever the Beit HaMikdash is going to be. Okay? Without getting too, uh, you know, without getting too social about it, just really quick. It will be. Straight, straight from your heart. Straight from your heart. Whatever you think the Beit HaMikdash is going to be. Not what it was, not what somebody else told you. What you think the Beit HaMikdash is going to be. It could be a word, it could be a picture, it could be a number, it could be a, you know, it's a lot of options. But it should come straight. Don't think about it too much. Straight out of your heart. No start to learn.
me finish, just uh, turn it over, and we'll come back to it later. You can try to forget about it. That would be good too. Not to make them that, just your note. Okay, another minute, let's say. So the, this Torah that I want to learn is, I didn't give you one today. Um, so maybe you could put mm -hmm. Maram and Tim Shalom. The Maram? I have also. No. I didn't get the idea. Tim Shalom. You can just give it out. Yeah, Tim Shalom. Don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah. I have a copy that's not so good. Let me give it to you. At least you could find a fly book. Okay. Okay. So you know, certainly I have you know over over the over the years of being introduced to this whole idea of the three weeks and the nine days and the shpua shachalbo, the three weeks of of mourning and the nine days in Chodesh Av and Menachem Av, and then the intensity as it comes into the the week that Tisha B'Av falls upon, and then Tisha B'Av itself, you know. I'm sure you realize, everybody in, from their own perspective and how long they've been here, but the difference in connecting to the whole Tisha B'Av being in Eretz Yisrael and then even more so in Yerushalayim is like night and day, they can't feel anyplace else. So, so have, having said that, and I, and I think you know, many people agree, still wonder like, how come, like, what's it all about? What's this whole morning about? And probably, why don't we have the base of Mikdash? When are we going to have the base of Mikdash? Are we ever going to have the base of Mikdash? So, I was very taken by the way the Sloan and Mareva, um, connected me to the whole idea of what does it mean to have a tshuka to the Beit HaMikdash, to really be, have a great desire for the Beit HaMikdash. Okay, so let's read this together a little bit and we'll talk about it. And please, uh, you know, you can feel when free. When and where was he? Slonim okay, good, good task. I'm saying that the Slonim Marevi, I think, passed away around six or seven summers ago, would you say? Maybe even up to ten? Slonim Marevi is coming. Right, but the, the Rebbe who wrote this, Reb Noach, he, I think, yeah, left the ago. world about 10 years ago. Yeah. Something very beautiful that um, my friend Ellie Kranzler told me one time. He, he had the school to go to the Rebbe. Oh, he went to the Rebbe, and he sat with him, and he said, Rebbe, I love the teachings in all, in all this form that you've given us. I just want to ask you a question. I hope it's not too chutzpahic, but it's very easy to learn your Sefer. I feel like I understand what the Rebbe was saying. How, how, how did that happen? He said, I didn't think about what I wanted to write. I just, whatever came from my heart, I just wrote it down. <clears throat> so it's really a beautiful safer in that way that, you know, as opposed to many other uh, teachings that you just touch the tip of the iceberg maybe and then you don't even know. Here it seems, could be wrong, that you're really connecting with what the Rebbe was, was wanting to teach. Okay. So, um, it's heading on the top, it's Bein What does it mean, Bein HaMetzarim? What's Bein HaMetzarim? Right, what does it mean? Between the bounds. Right, between the bounds. What else? Between a rock and a hard place. Between a rock and a hard place. Okay. 
It's in the straits. What what other word is there? There's another word there, clear as day. Tsar and Mitzrayim. Right? Because to me it says Bain Ha Mitzrayim. And Tsar, which is thin, but Tsar we also use Tzadik Reish. In place sometimes of Tzadik Ayin Reish, which I assume you're referring to, right? It's Bain. I wish I knew everybody's name. Tumcha. Okay, so as you say, just say your name, please, even if you assume I know. So, Bain Mitzrayim, this time we know, you know, historically, we've all people always teaching about it every year, we're reminded all the terrible things that happened over the years in these three weeks' time, including the breaking of the Luchot, including the spies going out, uh, as they're called, the Maraglim, and, 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 and Churban knocking down of the walls of, uh, of Yerushalayim, and, 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 and the burning of the Beit HaMikdash twice. And it's obviously a time that's wrecked with havoc for our people and the world. But still, sometimes, you know, that, that could feel very far removed. Okay, so I'm here, I'm in Yerushalayim now, it's great, I get to go to Yerushalayim, I get to go to city, to Shabbat, I can hang out in, at the walls. So, what is this morning about? At one time, painfully, heard a rabbi under the chuppah say, I don't want to break a class. I don't want to break a class. I cried enough. So let's find out, you know, through the eyes of the son of Rebbe, what it is that we're crying about. Okay? Um, I might really ask that somebody to read, because I apologize, I forgot my glasses. I did bring my glass case. Okay. Chazal amru, sholim v'dorshin v'yilchot ha-mu'ed. Okay. Chazal, they're asking and they're darshning out. Right? They're going deep into explaining. Hilchot ha-mu'ed. What's the mu'ed that he's talking about? Tisha B'Av. Right. Right, exactly. Tisha B'Av. Because, as we'll see later, as we'll see later, the Navi says in the Navi Zechariah, Tzom HaRavii, V'Tzom HaChamishi, V'Tzom HaShvii, V'Tzom HaAsiri, that those are the fourth month, right? Shiva Asur B'Tamuz, Yudzayim B'Tamuz, HaChamishi, the fifth, which is Tish'a B'Av, V'Tzom HaShvii, Tzom Gedalia, of the seventh month of Tishrei, V'Tzom HaAsiri, Asara B'Tevet, Yehiyeh lebeit Yehuda, that's us, lesasson and lesimcha, ulemoadim tovim. Ulemoadim tovim. We don't even have moadim tovim yet. We have moed. We don't even. We haven't gotten to the level of moadim tovim. To me, it sounds like. What does it sound like to you, moadim tovim? Sukkot is moed. Not yet. Why is Sukkot? Where? It's still called Moadim, as far as I know. No, it's called Moadim. Yeah? Okay. Maybe why build the Simchat Beit HaShavah? You say Moadim is Simchat. You say Moadim is Simchat. But I don't know. Okay, so, so Teddy will find us the source. I'll mean, I take your word for it. But what, I, but what I'm thinking, when I read Moadim Tovim, means I'm not going to have a choice. Like today, what's the difference between Shabbos and Chag? What's the difference between Shabbat and Chag? Mango. Okay? Um, depends where you live. But Shabbat, it happens. Right? Shabbat happens. Shabbat comes down, and we're invited into this higher place, but Hashem comes down to invite us to, into His palace of Shabbat. And it happens. We all know people who go out on Shabbat, and it's Shabbat for them. Because here, especially, once again, Shabbat happens. doesn't matter where you are, Shabbat is happening. How high you get to go with the Shabbat, how much you want to experience the holiness of Shabbat, that's up to us. But, but Yom Tov, but Chag, 
It's all about what we put in. We have to invest. We have to invest to make it festive, more it. Why don't we have to invest on Shabbat? Shabbat, we invest to, to connect to the holiness of Shabbat. We still have to invest, you have to eat. So That's beautiful, exactly. So if you're eating... But, you know, you, they say you're supposed to have, you know, better food, whatever. Because that's prescription that you should connect with the holiness of Shabbos. When you're eating, then you're eating different than you eat during the week. Or as Rabbi Shlomo used to say, you know, even if somebody makes fresh gefilte fish on Tuesday, it doesn't taste like the filter fish of Shabbos. It's not the same. Of course, you have to invest to connect to all that holiness and goodness. But Shabbos is happening. Shabbos just takes place. But the Chag, we create the Chag. What happened before we had a calendar? We went out, we, just, we, we had sent two witnesses up on a hill to see when is the new moon. We created it. Shabbos God created. So there's a difference between the two. But what I just want to say is that I have a feeling, I don't have a, I don't have a source for this. I just have a feeling that Moedim Tovim, for me, a difference between Moedim Tovim and Moed is Moed, I have to do. Moedim Tovim, it's going to be on the level of no choice. You're going to know, the world's going to know, it's Moed. The Moed that will be is Tisha B'Av, as you said. Okay? This There'll be Moedim Tovim. This world didn't bring in Yom Kippur. This, so. No. We'll, we'll, we, if we'll get far enough, we'll come to it. It's a good question. Yom Kippur is a Moed. Yeah. It's a Chag. Let's continue, yeah? One of the happiest hugging there. That's right. No, free pass. Why, why did I want to say? Because they say that um, when the Mashiach comes, please God, the Yom Kippurim, Yom Kippur would be like Purim, very, very happy. Right. So we already have that. We're just waiting for it to be put on every day. If you look at the Seder of Oda, it's not that. You look at the Seder of Oda, and you even look at the Pew team, the most famous people that are even coming from the Gush, of course, the most famous Pew is my Kohen. If you look at that, the whether it ever, ever happened or not, I'm not going to get into an argument here, I don't want to be crucified. But they said, well, I started. It's an interesting <laughs> choice of uh, <laughs> terminology, though. Why? Crucifixion did not come from Jesus. No, anyway, the raw, yeah. anyway, okay. the fact of the matter is, is that the uh, my Kohen describes. You know, very, very specific detail. The Chag, the Simcha that, that Bnei Israel had when when they came out of Beit HaMikdash, the Lee Peda. Um, it was an incredible Simcha, and therefore your analogy between Shabbat and Chagim might not hold because Yom Kippur is also Chag. Yom Kippur is Shabbat Shabbaton. Shabbat Shabbaton Yerachan. But it's still determined by the moon. If you remember the Gemara where Rabbi Ashi and Rabbi Yudanasi were writing, and one determined that Yom Kippur was a different day, and he was going to ride his donkey on the Yom Kippur that had all the time. That's because of the moon. You gotta be careful. You know, That's us see. seeing the moon. Okay. Anyway, Shkoyach. Okay, so let's go a little further, okay? V'nichlal b'zeh sh'b'chol z'man sh'b'chol z'man miyuta etzel yehudim I really can't see, sorry. Etzel yehudim. Etzel yehudim, tzarich l'lmod u'l'hitamek ma mashmu'oto ha'nitzchiyot sh'ba. So here he's presenting a very important concept about Jewish life. What he's saying. That every single holiday that we have, <coughs> we have to know what's the eternal aspect of the holiday. What does that say already about the Chag? That it has a future, but it also has a present. And what is it not? It's not a symbolism only of the past, it's alive. So every Chag that we have, don't we know it, is alive. And there for the taking, it's very alive, it's today. Okay? You have derech ze, yesh la'avin, inyam ha'avilut ala churban bimei bein ha'mitzari v'tisha ba'av. 
And from this, if you understand from it, if you look at it this way, then you can understand the Avelut, the mourning, let's call it, on the Churban Beit HaMikdash, in the days between Ben HaMetzarim and Tisha B'Av, these three weeks, starting from Yud Zayin B'Tamut, which was last week, and through Tisha B'Av, in different gradations of Avelut, which maybe we'll have time to get into. Sharei Eitzel Yehudi, Kol HaChagim V'Amoadim, Inyanam Nitzchi, because by a Jew, every holiday, Chag V'Amoadim, Inyanim Nitzchi, they have an everlasting aspect to it. Umaru im ken tafkir ayomim bevadai ein zera kamashmaut apshuta shal avilut mihitaber al ma shahaya ve'enenu. Clearly, he's saying this idea of mourning is not mourning about something that we that that we had and we don't have anymore. Shekem am Yisrael ino shomer al zichronot al avar ba'alma because the Jewish people are not keeping memories of the past, stam, memories in, in the world, if they wouldn't be connected to the present and the future. So therefore, in our case, if we're talking about the Beit HaMikdash, the way many people describe it, it's not that the Beit HaMikdash was burning. It's burning. It's not that the Chorban happened. It's happening. In some way, it might not be in a physical way, but certainly in a spiritual way, and in an interactive way. If we know, you know, the classic example that Gemara says of why why the second Beit Hamikdash was destroyed. If we pick that, because it's sadly enough apropos, was because sinat chinam, because of basically the hatred, or at least you could say the lack of avat chinam, is certainly present still today. Lack of avat chinam, which means sinat chinam, even though we don't like to say it about ourselves or about Hashem, about anybody else, hopefully. I don't want to say about the people who disagree with me that they hate me for no reason. And I don't want to hate them for no reason. But at least, you know, just because you put the hatred away doesn't mean then you got to the, the fixing. Everything in Yadut, as it says in Tehillim, is sur meira, then ba'asei tov. Turn away from the bad, it's a tough nut to crack. But then ba'asei tov. That hopefully, hopefully opens the door for us to do good, whatever that means. But first you have to turn away from the bad. As we know, you know, think about your personal life. Every time you have something that you know, some challenge that you're facing, First, you have to stop, and then advance. Because if you advance without stopping, generally you're going to fall back more steps. Okay. Okay. I once told a group of rabbis if they could do one great service to their respective communities, they could stop using the word symbolism in their sermons. There's nothing Jewish that's symbolic of only. There's only things that are alive. But then what about the term for the cross under the chupa? Isn't that a symbol? No, it's very real. It's what? very today. What, is, what does it mean, a symbol? A symbol is only, is only appropriate to, to, to Judaism, according to the Islam Rebbe, if it's also alive still today. It's something that happened in the past, but it's something today. You when you sit it. in the sukkah, let's take as an example. Oh, but wait, go back to the, the course. Okay. You break it, it can still be a symbol of, of remembering the Kulban, but it's also, as you said, a symbol of what's going on in our life and how 100%. it's changing. But a symbol is something that is seminal, it's something representing. Right, for me, what? when I use the word symbol, it means it's over, it's only there. It's something that, I, that was. It's taking a symbol and actualizing it to today. 
It's very much like the opening of the wall when we, as a symbol of Chorban uh, Beit HaMikdash. Oh, the opening of the wall? And opening. So it means leaving a yeah. part of the wall not done right. yet. Ah, ah, right, exactly. But that's still a symbol. It's maybe, it's, maybe it's just with a missing the, the language. It just has to be real today. It can't be past without a present and a future. That's, that's what he's saying. Oh, it's great what he's saying. Okay. No, but as you said, the same with the sukkah. Sukkah is also a symbol to remind us of not just that we lived in, uh, in booth in the in desert, but also uh, that we, that we're all, um, God, we're in the, uh, God's hands. Yofi, exactly, so, so that's the same but thing. It's still, but it's still a symbol. That's what we learned it from, yes. What's your name? The opposite, Eliezer. Give an example of a symbol that isn't alive. I don't know that we have symbols that aren't alive. Because otherwise they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be in Judaism. So we'll give a symbol outside Judaism. Give an example. I, know, I, I think it's hard to grasp that. What, what okay, just, that. I will in one second. I'll try to think of something. But I want to say about what you said about the sukkah. That's exactly what I mean. In other words, where do we know about the sukkah? It says in the Torah, Basukot Teshu Shivat Yamin. Okay? Basukot Teshu Shivat Yamin. Why? Ki basukot of shavti et b'nei Yisrael because the b'nei Yisrael dwelled in the sukkahs when they went out of Yisrael. And what, how could they dwell in the sukkah? They could dwell in the sukkah in the heat of the Midbar because God put on a kavor which physically and spiritually connected, protected and led the b'nei Yisrael to go eventually to Eretz Yisrael. And for us, it's the same thing. Arnea Kavo, the protective cloud, uh, clouds of glory. So even if we don't have clouds of glory today, but we still feel Hashem Yishmor, that God is watching us when we come and we go all the time forever. And it was Anan. Oh, it's called Anan Torah, Arnea Kavo. Arnea Kavo. Yeah. What was the. Recent military. Uh, one of the operations. Amur Anan. Amur Anan. Thank you. Right. Amur Anan the Faneno. The Amur Anan, the pillar of the cloud, was before us. Okay. Okay. So let's. Get, oh, you wanted a symbol that's not. I have to think about it anyway. I haven't given it a second thought. You have an idea? No. Now, everything's a symbol that's alive in Judaism. In Judaism. Yeah. I would say that there are certain civilizations where stuff happened in history, and it's forgotten. Well, what about the cross, for example? It, you know, the cross sure. is, an, is an ancient... Um, it's not Christian. It's an ancient... Doesn't make a difference. Oh. But, but it's a symbol. It's a symbol for the Christians for, for what happened. Yeah. Okay, but, but, right, but no. But I think you're making a good point that there are there, there are symbolisms. It's a sign. This has to be religious. Mm. There are symbols and things that happen in history that are forgotten. They were once symbols that lasted fifty years, hundred years, thousand years, and they're forgotten. It's the same thing with the uh, Nazi symbol. Unfortunately, it's not gone yet. It's still being used. Yeah, but it's very ancient. <laughs> okay, we'll come to the Shoah and the Sefer to connect it. Okay, let's go, let's read a little further. Ukfar Muzal, Zera al Hamet. This is something that's really very, very difficult to, to hear, so really, as uh, Shlomo would say, really everybody should open their hearts. No, I'm Gzera, no, Gzera Lamet, Alev. There is a decree about death that oftentimes happens that death is forgotten from people's hearts. You could converse, you could talk to people. We, we don't have to do a personal survey here, but, you know. You could agree or disagree. You say Kaddish, some people have an experience to say Kaddish over a loved one. They mamish the first month, two months, three months, they see the face of that person without even trying, right in front of them. Every time they say Kaddish. In the sixth, seventh, eighth month, 
Maybe they're not seeing it as much. I don't know what it means. I'm just saying that this comes from Pasuk and Tehillim, which is going to bring down. Dovra Melech intimates that, you know, death can be forgotten. What is the axiom? He's saying it is forgotten. He says, Nishkachti kemet milev. Aval kan katuv imesh kachech Yerushalayim tishkachim mineh. But by Jerusalem, he's making a difference. It's not that something died and is and can be forgotten. Yerushalayim he davar chai she'en hashichcha sholetet bo. Because Jerusalem is something that's alive, and that the concept of forgetting it doesn't rule over it. What does that mean to you? That last sentence, what he's saying. Let's read it again. Yeah? From here. What does that mean to you? Okay. Um, it means that therefore, since I already know that day can be forgotten, but Jerusalem, this idea of forgetting it doesn't come into the picture. At all. So he says, that's why we say, that's why it says in Al Naropa Vel, if I forget Yushalayim, Tahainu, that is, She'ere Otcha, Kedavar She'avad, if God forbid I will see Jerusalem as something that's lost, it's lost, which is almost impossible for every one of us since we're sitting in Jerusalem right now. And everybody here at one time or another, I assume, has felt mamish, the holiness of Jerusalem. If not, in your hearts, in your minds, and probably in every one of your bones, it's clear where we are. But that if, God forbid, somebody would say, I forget Jerusalem. It's lost to me. It's like I'm forgetting myself. It's my right. It's my, my, you know, the right side of me. It's a part of me. It's a part of my personality. So that's what he wants to say about Jerusalem. That it's not possible to forget Yerushalayim. If you do, your mom is just disregarding yourself. Disregarding yourself. When we say Yerushalayim, first of all, we were at the time in words in Yerushalayim. Or very few Jews were in living in Yerushalayim. Right. So the fact that we were governing to get to Yerushalayim is one thing. But when, when we say that in Mishkachech Yerushalayim, I would say that it's more what the Korban, what happened here, so that it shouldn't happen again, maybe. That's mm-hmm. the way I see it. Okay. That's definitely a big part of it. But he's going to come to something, I mean, I'll, I, I don't mind giving it away, but he's going to come to something that's, that's so much more powerful. He's going to say, there's a level of forgetting, there's a level of mourning that has to do with the past, but then there's a mourning that's so much deeper. Just I'm not just mourning over the past. My mourning is a desire, a deep desire for what's going to happen in the future. I miss Jerusalem so much. I miss Jerusalem so much that I can't wait till it's rebuilt. 
And he's going to say something contradictory here, but there's something that Shlomo used to tell us all the time, which I always thought was very beautiful. He used to say, you know, when you're sitting in New York and you're thinking that, you know, oh, I remember I was at the Kotel last month or last year, and, you know, I, I really miss the Kotel. I really miss the Kotel so much. He used to say, you don't know how, you miss, how much you miss the Kotel until you come back to the Kotel. Then you realize how much you really missed it. And the Slonim Rabbi is going to speak very much about what it is to miss. So, he says something, oh Teddy, you could really get have a field day with this. You will, in the next paragraph coming up. Okay? <laughs> oh, no. Okay, ready? Okay, let's go. Anybody want to say anything? Sorry. I got really upset by. So I was in a group of people, one, some visitors from New York, and the grandson was actually asking his grandfather, So would you ever move here if your son and your, your grandchildren, you know, if so and so and so and so moved here, would you ever move here? Never, never, I would never move here. And I got so insulted like it was me that he was rejecting. He was rejecting Jerusalem as an option. It was just like never, never, I would never live here. And I I got so hurt I said, it's too Jewish for you. It's too Jewish for you. Mm -hmm. And he um he does not think of Jerusalem as a viable future option for himself. New York is so much more real. And I thought that was horrible. We well, has lost part of himself. Yeah, that's the problem. But, it, but it's, it's very it's real. It's but everybody, listen. <laughs> why, why are you thinking? What part of himself? Excuse me. Because he's not thinking first. Since 1971. Okay. And I will tell you right now that after 30 years here, I could name to you at least five people that I know that have been here as long as I have. That actually, I was talking over with a friend of mine who just came that are so crazy. We all, all of us love to get on a plane and get yes. the hell out of this country. Yes, and I don't know about you, but I've been through four wars. So I come to mind. And um, I don't think that's losing part of yourself. If someone wants to live in New York and rejects you, Shalim, that's fine, excuse me. I'm, I don't want to be a heretic, but I think I've learned enough in my life to know. On top of that, um, Yehuda is talking See, I was good. Yehuda is talking, not your last, Yehuda is talking about many things, but um, I would suggest every one of you stare out the window for God's sakes. You shall lie in this belt. Look out the window. Okay? Look at not this house. Look out the window and it's awesome. Yeah. You notice that I made no picture of the temple. Wait, okay. I, I yes. About that, okay. Yes. Please go ahead. Why so, do you just put them down? Right. No, let's let's give them a chance to respond. People can live wherever they want. That's not the issue. Okay. The issue is that we are a tribe, and they have lost the connection to their tribe. I disagree. Because they're assimilating into a foreign land. The only way that that's built out there is because those people assimilated and made money and gave it to Israel. May well be. It's really not your taxes and mine don't I agree. It's not about houses and apartments and skyscrapers. It's about the Beit HaMikdash. No, it's about houses and apartments and having children and having grandchildren and, and having your children live here and going through the army and having your grandchildren and having your grandson call you and tell you he got A's on his courses today and everything. That's what it's about. It's about Jews until 1948. Maybe what Sarah is saying, and I'm just guessing, is that they could have been extremely orthodox Jews who came here, but don't can't imagine, I'm just guessing because you haven't said, but can't imagine yeah, well, living religious. here because, yeah. and they feel as if they are very much Jews living in the and please God, when the Mashiach comes, then they will come. I don't know, I'm just guessing. Well, maybe not, know. there's no such thing as Zionism. I don't think about the Mashiach ever right. coming. Right. Right. There are Orthodox Jews that are very happy having Israel and Jerusalem as a a Disney World for from Jews. It's like a okay, it's a, but I, I want to. I just to want to. Uh, but that's it. I just want to say this. To me, it's really important. To, to me, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know what? Yeah. Um, that right. doesn't matter. Belongs here. 
And that everybody can live this life. Okay, everybody so that's want. very, um, it's very much true for on one, one level, if not any other, they're not here. Not but the point is that we're all right and because Yerushalayim is alive for him in one way and for you in another way and for you in a different way and if it's not for somebody else, it's not for me to say, you know, I just need to right now make your shalom right for myself. That's what I want it to be alive for me. Because I have a vision of one day I want it to be even greater and for everybody. And maybe today it's not yet. But the Yerushalayim you have, Yehuda, is the same Yerushalayim possible that the Jew sitting in any shtibel or the former shul or conservative shul in New York City might also be dreaming of. The 100%. fact that he doesn't hundred percent is not a point to get upset about or angry yeah, about. 100%. I think that's what, we're, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like my energy needs to go into building up my Jerusalem of today. Your internal Jerusalem. And I could, ma? Your internal Jerusalem. Oh, very good, exactly. Exactly. Because he's, he's going to come to this, if we get that far, Obviously. one of the deepest things is building my own Jerusalem. This is where my Beit HaMittash has to be right now. Right now. Because I don't think I, I don't know, maybe other people, I know other people would like to, I don't see myself today taking the, the bricks and building the Beis HaMikdash. But, if I'm going to be on the level of Imesh Pachach Yerushalayim Tishkach Yimini, I have to build that Beis HaMikdash inside of me. Well, where does it come from the whole idea of the Beis HaMikdash? I know I'm getting off a little bit. V'asuli Mikdash v'shachanti b'tocham. Comes from Parsha Truma. And Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Tell the people to build for me a mikdash. And I will dwell in it. What? Shem needs a... Not in it. That's very important. I'll I'll dwell dwell in them. them. And I will dwell in them. So it means I will dwell in every single one of the people who creates a space for me. That's right. Yeah, but that's, you know... Yeah, yeah but the, the concept of eternal, one second, one second. Yeah. eternal beta mikdash, that's good for a nation that's dispersed around the world and, you know, praying for thousands of years to come back to some place. But now we have that someplace. Great. Now it's here. It's here and we have, we're, it's Chayda Kayam. Right. And it's in development. It's a work in progress. So that's it's exactly. not perfect yet, but it's a work in progress. 100%. To say that it, you're, you can be a good Jew by keeping, you know, developing your Jerusalem, your internal Jerusalem, and not, you know, coming to visit here for Disneyland say once enough. every few we didn't years. Say enough. <laughs> that's, that's not enough. No, we didn't say I'm not. We're all here, so we're not saying you're not. We're saying that even that I'm here, okay, I have to build my internal Jerusalem, but I have to be yearning deeply for the global Jerusalem. I don't want to get into politics, but if you look in Yeshayahu, it's very clear that the whole world is going to be invited. It's clear. Okay, so I'm, I'm yearning for that. While I'm yearning for it, one of the things that helps me yearn for it is to build my inside Yerushalayim. Otherwise, what's my connection? Just historical? No, that's the point. It's not only in something of the past. I have to be in it. I'm not a bricklayer. So I have to be building it here and missing it. Okay, we'll see. Let's see more of the Rebbe says. Less important what I say. Okay. You know, I want to skip ahead to something. Because I see we might not have time. I want I want to go ahead to the next page. And this I think is something very special, and it's very sensitive. So I'm, I'm you know it's a fair warning, I guess like they do on television. You know? So up until now we didn't talk about anything sensitive. <laughs> Not very I'm just overreacting. It's, it's, it's very beautiful. Hysterical. You know what? We need, we need, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah, we need people.
to feel so sensitive about it. To be to be so sensitive that any time somebody <laughs> says something about my Yerushalayim, I'm I'm hurt. But I don't have to be hurt against you. I can just be hurt in me. I'm hurt. The, the person is not alone. This you know, unfortunately, you look at the surveys. There's more than thirty percent of Jews of the world say. I don't need Israel to be part of my being, to be Jewish. I'm still, I'm Jewish. But that's not, we're not here to judge them as much as we are to say, oh, that would kill me. This would kill me. I can't wait till everybody's here. I can't wait till everybody's here. Obviously, I didn't, I didn't wait. Right? Everybody who's here, I'm assuming, was called or whispered to, and at some point, a year, two years, 10 years, 20, 30 years down the line, got on the plane and said, I'm here. So you, 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 you know, you, we all heard that. We all heard that we were called. Okay, so. Okay, I'm just gonna skip around Look down, look down on the bottom of the, of the first page in the second column. Look what he says. And I find it so beautiful. He says, this is why I said it could be a little contradictory to what I said. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six lines from the bottom. Ukmoshi katuv marana adonenu morenu brabenu. You see that? Bebet Avraham schutay again aleinu ba'michtav ki. You see, it's a little darker because I I outlined it. Ki hagaguim l'davar hen yoter gedolim me'etzem hadava. Right. What does that mean? The uh, longing for something um, <coughs> is always more than the actual thing. That's right. <laughs> it's more than the greatness. And the greatness of the actual thing. Okay? So, so what's really important is I have to really miss it. That's the first thing. Is I have to really, really miss it. Absence makes the heart go fonder. Yes, I'm only going to get it at some point. But by the time that happens, it'll be a different world. But he said, absence makes the heart go fonder. And I said, father. Father, okay. It's, it's, for me, this is more of a, you know, absence makes art profound is, is, is one way of people to, to describe what, what, what Rebbe is saying, but it's very, very uh, different. This is really, I think, a lot deeper. Well, there are different ways of looking at this. Right. So when you, when you love with somebody, you miss them, when they're away from you, you, love, you want them more. Yes. Well, yes, but when you're Rashi on that said, Rokhok me'ayin, me'alev. Hmm. Yeah, no, no, it's, there's conflicting, but it's a philosophical thing too, you know, one thing right. is better than that. I have that. to stand up, sorry, to the camera. But, but, he's, but he's saying something even more than that. So what's your name? Esther. Esther? Mm -hmm. Which I think Esther copped it right away. And that is that the more, if you really, really miss something, then that's, you have arrived. You have Fill the prescription. You have done what it is that was asked of you to not forget Yerushalayim. I really want Yerushalayim now. I want Yerushalayim. I want it now. What happens when we're going to get it? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I don't know what the euphoria is going to be. I don't know what it means, Yom Kippurim. I don't know if every day is going to be Purim. I've heard a lot of things, and I want to believe all of them that sound, you know, positive and awesome and great. But I know one thing, right now, I have only one thing. That's to really, really want it. That's the Ga'aguim. That's what's gonna take everybody to another place, to another level. It's to really, really, really want it. And obviously, I will say to you, I will say, for me, it's much easier for me to really, really want that euphoric future Avat Hinam, Beit HaMikdash, whatever the Beit HaMikdash is going to look like, because I don't know. Whatever that's going to be, 
it's, it's for me easier to really feel the intensity of that yearning being in Yerushalayim than if I would still be in Farakway. For me. What, what's very interesting recently, maybe the past 10 years or something, is when I, when I came here and, you know, we still fast, fast went to Shabbat, and a lot of the Chilonim and even some of the Datim said, well, Zalama the Benalai. It's just not, okay, fine, this happened however many years ago. Do we need to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash? It happened, we're, we're mourning for it. But what recently is happening is that uh, you have many um, people who don't consider themselves orthodox um, now getting together and learning about it and, and learning how we can do tikkun with, uh, in, in our society and how it's much bigger things. It's not just, it's exactly what you're saying. It's not just the past, it's the present and how are we going to uh, rebuild the future and how and the whole business of Sinat Chinam, which I think is... It's a feeling that we're moving forward to something right. good, I hope. Right. And the thing is, the, th the, other th the other thing is that, what is it, I'm talking about building the, my in inner base of the I want to be on fire. I want to be on fire for something all the time. I don't want to be passive and complacent and say, okay, this is good enough, it's fine. It's okay. to keep the fire nice. all the time. I want to be on fire. Listen, what does the mission say? Who's a rich person? Who's wealthy? Somebody who's happy with what they have. When is that true? By, by, by materialistic <coughs> things. By spiritual, by ruchniyot, there's never an end. How do you know? What's the name, what's, what's the name of God? And self. There's no end. If ruchniyot, if spirituality is... It says in, it says in Mishlei, Ki ne'er Hashem nishmat adam. Because the, the candle of God is the neshama of a person. That means, there's, there's, the Arizal says, that my neshama like, is connected to the seed of God like a spiritual umbilical cord. And that umbilical cord is never severed. So every single neshama in the world as covered as it is with all kinds of other stuff, it's still there. That's the famous terminology in Yiddish called the pinta liyid. What's the pintle? What's the point? What's the nikuda? That's the nikuda. We all have a nikudat nishmati. We have a nikudat of godliness in us. We all have a nikudat Eretz Yisrael. But we did a good job, you know, putting a lot of blinds on and all other kinds of stuff so we can't see it. It filters. Filters. It wasn't enough that God was meant some tzim himself for us. We decided to do our own tzim tzum. And we filter it with this and filter it with that until we get so distracted that we don't even know that it's there. So the building of your own Beit HaMikdash is saying, I want to be on fire. I want to see my spark be bright all the time. Because that's what's going to show me the way. That shows me what my next step is. Everybody has a next step here. There's no question that your next step and my next step are two different steps. But if we both could be, could be just seeing the other go in a beautiful direction, that would change the whole world. You know, if you want to talk about Ahavat Hinam, I saw something once very beautiful. The Rabbi Nachman says, when the Bnei Yisrael crossed the Yamsuf, and they crossed the Red Sea, should have gone across in one line. That would make the most sense. Very unified. We were all taken out of this room. We were all slaves. We were all taken out. And after Nachshon Ben Amin Adav jumped in, we all going in after him. But we didn't go in one line. The Major says we went in 12 lines. 12 Shvatim. Each one went in their own line. What, were they fighting? Were they arguing? No, Rabbi Nachman says that the Major says the water between them was like it was transparent, it was like glass. They could see through. Why? So, not so they could say, you know, you know, your, your way is pretty good. But if you would do it my way, you would really be very firm. You would be doing the right thing. But no, that's not. Rabbi Nathan says, each one looked at his brother and sister and said, wow, your way is so beautiful. 
That's our vat I don't have to disagree. I don't have to agree with you. I don't have to agree with you, and you don't have to agree with me. Guess what? In my humble opinion, we're never going to agree, and that's just fine and dandy. Exactly. Okay. But the one thing that we have to do is not get down on each other. We can't. And part of that is like, I like myself. We don't know that one. We grew up, we were taught that it's gaivadik, that it's haughty. We have to lerecha kamocha ani adonak. How do you learn how to love somebody else? You have to learn how to come You can do it in a humble way. But if you don't like yourself, you can't can you get it together with somebody else. Avat chinam starts here. Okay. Come back to it. Because the Maral talks about this and uses a word. It's called shleimut. Shleimut. To be complete, to feel a sense of completeness. Okay, so go, go, please to um, to the next page. And somebody, just because I'm sorry, it's really taxing for me. Could somebody read this? We have next. We don't have. No, we yeah. Have oh well. Page. Yes, the next page. Right. What's it? What's it I happen to have it right here. <coughs> Where is it? 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 Where is I myself. <laughs> Sorry. No you don't want to sing? I said I couldn't help myself. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Just have to be sarcastic. I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. Well, what was going on? What's the story? What's the story with Plato and, uh, and Yirmiyahu and Avi? They were contemporaries and he saw Yirmiyahu crying. So I'm crying. So what does he say to him? Apologize again. If I have my glasses, I would be flying through it. And... What does he say to him? Oh, okay, you want to read it? Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. What does that mean? It's proved. He knew. He knew he was. He knew it. Right. Right. He had wisdom, great wisdom. He had great, he had real respect for Yirmiyahu's wisdom. Okay? So what does he say? It doesn't matter if it's, up, it's, it's uh, semantics. Bottom line is he recognized the greatness of the, of the wisdom of Yirmiyahu. He recognized it. And what does he say to him? Yeah. What does that mean? What does it mean? How can you cry over the spilled milk? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. How is it matim for somebody wise like you to cry over something in the past? Only, I'm putting in. Okay? So what happens? He's still talking. Kivar Nisraf. He said, what, what are you bother crying for? What is the point? What's the point? <coughs> what good is going to come out of your crying? Okay, just, I, I don't know, I don't know what the time constraint is, although I have a little bit. What's the time now, please? 20 to 10. 20 to 10. Okay, so we have only till 10, so let me just... Uh, say what he says to him, okay? Because I really want to get to the morale too, and I want to have you draw your new base on Migdash again on the other side after this. Okay, so so he says to him, listen, I don't understand you. So sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. He says, I don't understand you. You're a smart guy. I know you're a smart guy. What are you crying? You crying over that temple thing again? It's gone. Forget it. It's gone. Doesn't make any sense. Give me our system. I can't explain it to you. He says, why not? Because you wouldn't understand. You wouldn't get it. Because you wouldn't get it. So I wouldn't get it because <coughs> it's a Jewish thing. Basically what he says to him. It's a Jewish thing. What do you mean? He says, okay, basically says, I told you you wouldn't get it. What's the difference? He says to him, look, the Jewish people, when they cry, I'm getting up early to get a drink. The Jewish people, when they cry, says, the world cries, as Eliezer said before, right? The world could cry, or as you intimated, or wanted me to bring you an example, and it's forgotten. You know what I mean? It's Hiyush. I give up. Despair. Thanks. I give up on it. It's not going to be anymore. That's it. Right? Yankee Stadium is knocked down. 
La Havdil Beit Elif Al Feyav Dolis. It's gone. Right? Faith Paradise put up a parking lot. <laughs> to borrow a phrase. I'll tell you, I have a funny story, but I'll tell you then, I don't want to get funny now. But about Joni Mitchell and that song. But anyway, so, so, but he says a Jew, a Jew doesn't cry tears of despair only. A Jew cries tears of hope. The two eye theory. Tears of sadness, tears of joy. <coughs> what the Gemara says, a person who cries and then decides when they're sad is only accompanying the Yet Sahara for whatever he wants. You cry, you're sad. But then you need to have a future. Otherwise, God forbid, what would you do? I have to tell you a story, and I hope I won't start to cry. But last week in Tekoa, as you might have heard, one of our, everybody's best friend, Mamish, everybody's best friend, drowned. And he was 32 years old. And he had a heart attack. He went into the Bormayim, and he had a heart attack. It was shocking for all of us, because Hillel, any time there was a Brit Mila in Tukal, he showed up, he didn't wait to be invited, with his mandolin and he played. And he baked bread to the whole community. And any person who came, he said hello to them and he smiled and he meant it, it was natural for him. It was like, this guy was spreading love and joy. This guy was, you know, the, the consummate holy hippie. Even though, you know, he grew up in Hashmonaim. But he doesn't know anything about Aid Ashbury. And he left the world, boom, like that. And people were freaking out the first time. It was Shabbos, it was Erev Shabbos, a few hours before Shabbos. It was a very trying Shabbos. But, Moch Hashem, we got into Shabbos. But once Shabbos was over, we didn't have that great Yisod, so to speak, at least, you know, to lean on. We had to get into the real world. And the real world was, wow, for some people, what did we do? What did we do? So we got together, 40, 50 of us on Sunday night. And people were saying, hey, we came here because what, what did we do? What, what, what's, you know, what did we do wrong? And I said, you know what? Let's cry first. Let's feel the pain. If God gave us this pain, it obviously was meant for us to feel it. So first let's feel it. I don't want to think about it. I'll think about it later. You know, when, when, when the story of Hanukkah took place, it took a year to dedicate the holiday, to make a decision, okay, now what do we do with it? We don't decide a day after somebody dies, okay, what should we do with this now? Who's on that level? Right? So the Gemara says, the Yetzirah wants you to think that you're bad, you're sad, it's just sad. That's it. That's what your Miel saying to Plato. So we can't live in that place of bad, sad only. That's not why I'm crying. I'm crying tears of hope. I can't wait for the Beit HaMikdash to be rebuilt. I can't wait. And I miss it so much that every second that I'm missing it, I'm crying. So yes, you know, we have lots of stuff to be happy about, to be misamech about. But in these three weeks, we're mima'atin b'simcha. Actually, now in these three weeks, it's supposed to be from Rosh Chodesh Av, Gemara and Ta'anit says, We make our simcha a little bit less. Where did it come from, the three weeks then? Because of the Yitzayim the Tammuz started the this, the break, siege of the walls of Jerusalem. Yeah, but no, but I'm saying that you said that we should lower our 
of joy or happiness, so why, why do we do it in the three Because the minute of Yisrael became that they started the gradations of this type of mourning. But the Gemara says, <coughs> and the truth is that Be'idot HaMizrach it still makes machot until Rosh Chodesh Hav. Some, yes. But, okay, so, so the thing is that, for, so therefore for us now, again, coming back to today, Yumiyah is not here anymore, we're here. Okay. I need to see that hole lacking, but I need to know that I want to fill it. I need to fill it. I need to make it real. So I said about Hillel, what do you love about Hillel? What do you love about him? You loved how beautiful he spoke to his kids? And, okay, you recognize there's something missing? Okay. Now, I gotta fill the hole. I need to talk to my children with this awesome amount of love and patience that he did all the time. That's all I need to do. But first I have to accept that he's gone. And if I want to cry, I can cry. But I can't stop there with he's gone. Because then I'm not doing anything to fix the world. I'm fixing the world when I do something. So I want to start building the Baytanic Dutch. But I'm not a bricklayer. So I'm going to start building it here. I just start building the Baytanic Dutch just by smiling at Eliezer. Mamash. That's how we could build the Baytanic Dutch. I don't know you. I don't know anything about you. You don't know me. But I'm sure if I told you about myself, you'd find plenty of things that you don't like. <laughs> so, okay? No, we're not talking past here, we're talking present. Yeah? You understand what I'm saying? Okay? But that's not important. What's important is that we just want to smile at each other. Because I want you to feel good. I want to feel that. There's something that's lacking so much that I want to make it happen. I want to create a space in my heart. I want the Shekhinah back in me. I want it back. I don't want to be missing a limb. God forbid. I don't want to start talking about it, but God forbid. You know anybody that's missing a limb? I don't want to be missing. So I need to do something to not be missing. Otherwise, it's going to stay missing all the time. And then what happens? It dies. <coughs> then it dies. That's what David Amalek was talking about. The Ani, the rather the Met, the Shkoch at Amet. So I have to make it be alive. So, so this year on Tisha B'Av, you have to be crying tears that Iman is just really don't want to live without the base of the Shemim. We say it every Shabbos. A lot of Jews say it every Shabbos, but we happen to be here. We call Chal Ma'ken Otafia. We tim lo chalenu matai ki mechakim anachnulach. When is it going to happen? Only when we're waiting for it. If we're not waiting for it, there's no point in it happening. I mean, like, why should God get involved if we're not interested? You're not interested, okay? I am very interested. I don't know what I'm interested in. I don't have to draw the picture like you do. But I know one thing. I'm really interested in living in a world where everybody just naturally wants to love each other. I'm not even going to the level of loves each other, wants to. You know, the Rambam and the Ramban, they disagree a lot. Because one of the things that they agreed on that every one of us has to want to know God. Want to. I don't know what God's about. I don't know what's going on in this world. I have no idea. But I want to connect to the will of God. I don't know what it is. 
But if I practice a little bit every day, I feel like maybe I'm getting a little closer. So if I practice every day thinking about somebody that maybe in the past I didn't care for so much, if I could just think and say, you know what, I need to care for them. I need to care for them. Do you know that a Kohen, sorry, do you know that a Kohen, when he gets up to say the Perkat Kohenim, there's one word of the bracha which just, uh, uh, what's that word in English? Uh, you know, Shemashpia, that, that just so influences on what he's doing there that without it, he can't do it. What's the word? Be'ahava. And what, what does Shkonar say? The Shibura says, the Ramah, I think, says, that if you walk into a Beit Knesset, your Kohen, and you see somebody that you can't love, like you don't like them, you're not allowed to get up. You're not allowed to get up and do the Bekat Konim. Yeah. You're not allowed. Because you're making a bracha l'matal, because you're not doing it by because you can't stand that guy's guts. Out. Right? And I want to live in a world where everybody's blessing everybody else. We practice it, you know, when we say the Kiddush Levana. We say Kiddush Levana, and I turn to you and I say, Shalom Aleichem. What, I think it's just some uh, old Yiddish uh, colloquialism? Shalom Aleichem. I'm giving you the highest blessing. Shalom. It's God's name. It's when, it's when the world is going to be totally at peace. Everybody's going to recognize. Everybody's going to recognize it. That's what I'm blessing you when I say Shalom Aleichem. I mean, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable, powerful blessing. So Shlomo used to make us, at Kiddush Levana, turn to the next person and say, with, you know, from the deepest place of your heart, Shalom, Aleichem. We just have to practice some of this stuff, you know? Stop theorizing about it. Okay. Uh, so I want to read this Maharal with you. Hopefully... Maybe it's a little light on it. I can see it good. And I think we'll have to stop after that. So I have a few copies of this. He's obviously my pet peeve. There's a lot of things. Okay. And I, and I, and I, I don't know. Let's look on together. I don't have another. Okay. So this is my fav- favorite piece of Mahara in the whole world. It's on... Um, well, it's on the page that's not blank. The side with the letters. Okay, go down to uh, Otvav. Okay, this is from the Maharal. V'yodua ki idiyat ha'efachim echad. From Gvurot Hashem. Okay. Somebody want to read? We're in the interest of time. Okay, I'll try to read it. ששני הפכים משלימים להיות הכל. The two opposites complete to make everything. בלי חיסרון. שמאל ימין. It's together. They're the opposites. But now I have both of my hands. Correct. And many, many philosophies. Okay? Because <clears throat> there's a thing and it's opposite. Once you have those two things, there's nothing missing. That's what Achdut is about. Once you have Achdut, there is nothing else. Nothing. Everything's in. It's totally unified.
כשהוא אחד משלים לכל. I'm going to translate this in a, in a very broad way. And I'm going to say, what does it mean to be shalem, the, the world shalem? What's something that I know of that we have that's clearly shalem? A circle. And Hashem says, listen, I know you all want peace. You want it your way, and you want it your way, and this guy wants it his way. Everybody wants peace, okay? But, so I'm going to make you a deal. You want peace? You have to bring the two opposites together. Because I'll tell you why. There can't be peace without me. Because I am everything. And if shlemut means everything, I need to be in the circle. So you need to invite me in the circle. But, one thing I have to tell you. If I can't invite him in the circle, me, you, the cats, so Hashem is saying to me very clearly, I'm not coming to the party. I'm not coming to the circle if you can't invite him. And furthermore, in the interest of time, you're going to see, if you look down, that he says that the last line, Next to the sign, it should be. B'meh shezeh katzeh or echad ba'ashini or katzeh ashini. You need to invite from this extreme and that extreme. That's enough to drive you crazy, right? But that's the deal. This is the deal. The Maharal says, this is the deal. You want to have peace, you have to invite God. And that means you have to invite the guy that you really think is out of his mind and has no idea of what the truth is. I didn't show you, by the way, but if you look up before where I was quoting some Ravi, quoting from Zechariah, he says at the end, V'ha'amet v'ashalom e'havu. Something we don't have today. The truth is oftentimes what gets in the way of peace. Eventually, emet and shalom will be one. I just want to tell you a fast story, and then uh, I guess we'll have to stop. Oh, no, you have to draw your data with that. Okay. Yeah. So I'll tell you a fast story. I have time? <coughs> I tell the story a lot of times. It's always, you know, I love, you know, I love the Shlomo that he told me hundreds, he told us all hundreds and hundreds of Hasidic stories, even though I always felt that he was, the story was all about him. But this story Mamish happened. I was in Los Angeles, and uh, I had big school. Every morning for three years, I get to learn with this, with this man who, in 1986, he came to Los Angeles with the Rimit Zarebi. He was his, he was his, uh, his Gabbai, here in Eretz Israel. And the Rimit Zarebi told him that he needed to go to Los Angeles. And he asked him to come with him, with his family. His name is Rabbi Yaakov Safranovich. He's still alive today. He's still living in Los Angeles. And he uh, was a chassid of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he was the Malaveh, the Gabbai of the Vimitz Rebbe. Around 1989, I think it was, I started at the school to learn with him every day, 1989, 1990. Every morning at 6.30. And one night I'm in the studio all night, and I come knocking on his door at 6.30. My eyes must have been popping past his forehead. And he looks at me and he goes, you are crazy, go home. <laughs> I said, uh, okay, I'm crazy, but I'm here. He goes, you are crazy, go home. I said, no, come on, Rebbe, I'm here, I want to learn. He goes, you know, most people in the world Nobody tells them the truth. Oh, you're a lucky man. You have two people that tell you the truth. Your wife and me. And I'm telling you, you are crazy. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess he saw, you know, like, I really didn't want to go home. So he says to me, tell me something. Remember, he came to the United States in 1986. He says, tell me something. You hippies. You did something? I said, yeah, I think we did. What you did? I told him, well, I think, you know, we, 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 we tried to bring love into the world. He goes, I love Shmov. If it was so good, how come it didn't stick? 
<laughs> so you made me think. And I said, because we forgot to invite God to the party. He says, okay, you can come in now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we could be crying and crying and crying. There's like this massive party waiting for us. Your picture might be one party, and you might have a different party, and you have a different party. We all want to go, if we could really be honest. You know, if we knew what true Simcha was, who wouldn't want to be there? So, you know, I bless us that, uh, I don't know, Hashem Shamar Nakat Pani Israel, maybe that's what he's waiting for, I don't know. But everybody should uh, be blessed to to feel the, the, the mamish, mamish yearning for the Beit HaMikdash and to build the Beit HaMikdash in their heart and to find a partner to build the Beit HaMikdash with and to continue to create partnerships of building. Ad the Biyat HaMashiach and the Gula shall come. Amen. First of all, thank you. Oh. <coughs> Make us all think. Um, I was uh, reminded of two very dear friends of mine who were calling in, who passed away 10 years ago at the age of 36, JJ Greenberg, and um, just uh, Sukkot uh, this year, um, Azrael Cohen. And they were very special people, and uh, it was very, I feel as if. When you're talking about Duchan, every time I have, um, I, I'm in Shulana, there's Konim giving Duchanim, I actually see their faces. They were special and they were loved people. So that really made me connect. Um, and my Beit just comes out of the heart. So I thought, number one, we could maybe go out with the, with the song Bill Barbie. Okay. And second of all, talking about love, Woodstock. July 18th. And hippies. I mean, how can it not all be connected? But they didn't invite God to it. Okay, so then I'm going to do two very quick commercials. So first of all, before I start, I didn't want to start with that, with that commercial, but I just want to, I want to say thank you very much. You know, I think I've been blessed to dedicate, you know, a lot of my time for the last six years to this project. And uh, it's beautiful to see young Israeli people that maybe many of us don't meet every day, that are yearning for something that nobody ever told them about. And it's beautiful. And so, uh, people want to know. They don't want to be deprived. So, uh, everybody should, should, should please try to help, to give uh, support to AMI and Shima, and tell friends about it, and uh, whatever you can do to help trying to do good things for all young people, young people that are never at risk and that have a lot of issues to deal with, and young people that just need to strengthen their, their identity as Jews and as people. And the last commercial I want to make is that on July 20th, which is Motzei Shabbat Nachamu, we decided in Tekoa that we're going to make an evening of Biyachad. Uh, to say to the world, you know, instead of machloket, you know, we have arguments, we have differences, fine, but it's more important for us to try to be together. So I invited some friends of mine, so Baruch Hashem, are very, very talented musicians, to come. And whoever comes has to take part in the evening. Either sing along, or dance, or meditate along, also give 30 shekels along, and to be a part of jumping on to use music to bring people together. So I'm going to do it in my house in Tekoa on Matzah Shabbos and we're going to film it um, with, the, with the professional uh, crew of people. We have, thank God, you know, in Tukar, we have, uh, we have uh, 600 families and 140 artists, so... No 600 families? Yeah, no shortage of, uh, of artistic, talented people, including uh, film directors and cameramen, so... Uh, we want to just give out a little taste to the world. This is what the Eden can do. Okay, we want to sing Govavi.